so many thrilling moments in cricket and it's very interesting the kind of cricketers you mentioned were also uh, my favorites while growing up in fact back in 2015 both of us wrote an article you titled yours virendra sehwag wild animal of batting i titled mine virendra sehwag shattering cricket's utopia and the idea was the same i grew up idolizing virendra sehwag and even though i was surrounded by arguably more technically gifted cricketers like sachin or rahul dravid i never tuned in to actually watch them or even jack callis uh, but cricketers like brendan mccallum and especially in that period i remember since you mentioned brendan mccallum uh, i remember the 2015 world cup phase where it was it just feel like he was operating on a completely different level not just batting but even fielding the way he was throwing himself around on the field and i remember the final was happening at 3 am in the uk and i had timed my alarm for 3 but i i, I snoozed it for 5 minutes and by the time i tuned in he was already out and it was the biggest heartbreak of my life um but not just brendan mccallum even i used to tune in for cricketers like lance kluzner shai the freedy as well and these were the kind of people always appeal to me along with sevag and at at some point in my life i actually wanted to dissect why they appeal to me when i had other cricketers that clearly the rest of the nation used to really love and in your article there was a line that really stood out for me and it was you said when you speak about sevag you said that when you bowl to him you weren't bowling to a batsman you were bowling to a belief system and you personally as well you've tried to emulate that belief system in your own life you've try to emulate the process of going for a big hit and then remaining calm if you get it or even if you miss it and then trying to for, go for a big hit again so the question that arises from here is do you think the kind of cricketers that appeal to us appeal to us because of something more than just their cricketing ability or what they perform on the field do you think the kind of traits they show on the field or the kind of persona they have or the attitude the way they approach the game if that mirrors our own personality trait or the way that we approach life in a certain way then there's a much higher chance of them appealing to us Yeah, well I mean we're projecting at a certain point because we don't really know the person and you know as much as I love Vrind Sehwag as a player like some of his tweets well not that he writes them but some of his <laughs> tweets are idiotic. Yeah. Um you know and certainly not that. So you are projecting to a certain point. But I remember I I had a girlfriend uh, who she watched a little bit of cricket and she loved Ricky Ponting. And one of the things she loved about Ricky Ponting was how single-minded he would be. right he knew what he wanted to do he was going to do it occasionally that would upset people but that was Ricky Ponting he was neat he was tidy he did everything right and you know i remember her telling me that once and then i looked at the way that, and i happened to work with her and i looked at the way she worked and i and i was like aha that's you want to be Ricky Ponting here and i think that there is an element to that and if you look at the cricketers that that you know uh, i mentioned before you know there's certainly you know whether it be McCallum or a Sehwag or Gilchrist there's a certain throwing out the conventional way of doing things and also like there's a there's a in their patek in their particular mind there's a real fear of failure that they don't have right they're just backing themselves that their talents and their belief and the way they do things is going to work over the long run they realize that they'll never worst day it's going to be horrible but they don't focus on the worst day the way that perhaps other athletes do. So they're not trying to minimize their worst days what they're really trying to do is maximize their best days. Which isn't what Jack Scales did and which isn't what Raul Dravid did. They they have a completely different mindset and, and how they go about it. I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong, but for me personally, I probably that's what I look towards is uh, my failures are large and spectacular and I've had many many failures over the years, but that's okay because um uh i i know my successes are usually even larger and people remember them more and over time if you succeed succeed enough people even just forget that you've ever failed they start to build you up as this this other person and so and also you know for me personally i think so gilchrist was the one where i it really the, the whole the belief system thing that you're talking about really comes from gilchrist where at a certain period in my life i realized i hadn't achieved anything because i'd just been afraid i didn't know where to get started i didn't know how to become a writer i didn't know how to become a filmmaker i didn't know how to do all these things so i just sat back and didn't do anything because i didn't want to fail at them and i didn't I, i you know i didn't really understand the system and then you see gilchrist play and miss terribly at a defensive ball like he's not even in the postcode of the ball and then next ball similar ball he just smacks over deep mid wicket and you're like so the net, the previous ball or the previous innings or whatever it may be hasn't affected him right 
And then you start you start to think about how that will affect your life. And I think we project to a certain point. I, I happen to have met Adam Gilchrist quite a bit um, even before I became a cricket writer. Well, I spoke to him quite a bit um, in, in one of my previous jobs. And he's not really like me, right? His personality is not like me. He's actually in some ways kind of a, a far nervier person than I am, I think. He's probably not as confident as me in many. If you watch him commentate, you really get a really good sense of probably who Adam Gilchrist is. He's a very nice guy. He's very thorough. But he's gone on to be almost like the straight man, right, in the commentary. Like other players that weren't as good as him, like Mark War and, and um, Damian Fleming, they and Brad Hodge provide much more analysis when they're on air with Gilchrist than Gilchrist does, right? He's very reserved. But watching him play... That's where I got that energy from and that sort of moved on to, I suppose, Sewag and then and then McCullum as well. I know exactly what you mean by the thrill of watching uh, the snail on a razor blade analogy for watching Adam Gilchrist or Sewag because I used to feel that every single time Sewag used to come out to bat and more often than not, he would actually fail because mm. you know, centuries are... That you only have 20 centuries out of 200 innings. More, more often than not, every batter fails, even the ones who don't have that style. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, that, that, that's, I think, w- what you're probably trying to do in sport at a very high level, and we're talk, sort of talking at an intellectual level here, everyone's getting something different out of sport, which is why I try and promote sport to as many people as possible. So there are people who are trying to get, there are many people whose only thing about sport is going out, standing on the terrace and swearing a lot. Right. Right. And, and that sounds really terrible, but there's probably a reason they need to do that. Their job sucks. Their life sucks. They're not happy in their marriage. They're having trouble as a father, as a mother, as a lover, whatever their problem is. Right. And that Saturday afternoon or, you know, uh, whatever sport they're into matters. And the same for the people who take amateur sport really seriously. Very similar type of people. All the way through to someone like me where, where sports become my profession, but even before that probably changed the way I live my life at a very high end level. And then you've got what it can do for different parts of society and disabled people and women and, you know, uh, people from, you know, lower caste and the wrong skin color and all these sorts of things in society. You realize that sport plays a different role for all these different people. So the most important thing really with sport is make sure that as many people have access to watch and play and grow with every individual sport so they can find their, whatever it is, whether it's just them yelling at the left back or whether it's, you know, their chance to become the world heavyweight champion of the world. It doesn't really matter. It matters that they're getting something out of it. And I think that's, um, I think that's a really important thing. And so, you know, I take one thing, you take another thing. It doesn't really, there's no right answer or wrong answer. 